One thing all managers do, regardless of their place in the organizational hierarchy, is make decisions. Decisions about whom to hire, what to sell, and even what markets to enter, to name a few. Now, of course, all decisions aren't weighted equally. Certainly a decision, like whether to acquire another company, has a more significant impact on the organization than, let's say, deciding what to serve during a working lunch. But regardless of significance, each decision has a unique set of factors that need to be evaluated. Now, this video isn't about how to make the right decision, as what is deemed to be right is up for debate. What this video is about is how to make rational decisions. For starters, let's discuss the basic idea of decision making. I'll define decision making as simply a process of choosing a course of action out of a number of different alternatives. But as managers, we should strive to do more than simply make decisions. We should strive to make decisions that reflect a careful analysis of the available facts and that best solve our established problem. So how do we do such a thing? Well, probably one of the most common frameworks for making decisions is what's known as the rational decision-making model. To summarize the model, it represents a linear process designed to help the user make more rational decisions. There are a total of six stages, each of which is intended to get the user closer to that final decision. Now that we know a little bit about the model and its intent, let's get into the different steps. The first step of the rational decision-making model is to identify and define a problem. Now people experience many problems each and every day, but we don't address all of them because they may be somewhat insignificant. In order for someone to address a problem, the gap between their current and desired state needs to be enough to motivate them to exert the energy needed to solve the problem. Assuming that we identify a problem, we now need to define it. This can be a very difficult process as people often identify symptoms of a problem but fail to identify the actual cause of the issue. Let's say that my problem is that my house is too small and I need a bigger one. My family is growing, we're accumulating more stuff, and our existing space simply isn't meeting our needs. So I guess I need to buy a bigger house. Well, maybe not. What I'm demonstrating here is that we often make decisions too quickly and also without considering all available options. What often happens is we attempt to define a problem, which is good, but we also attempt to establish a solution without thinking about the alternatives. Maybe I could have a room added on to my existing home or even place some unused items in storage to free up space. Those things may solve my problem or they may not, the important thing is that at this stage, we simply want to define our problem in such a way that allows us the opportunity to generate a host of solutions later. So let's say for now that my problem on its most basic level is actually related to space. The next thing that we need to do is to identify the criteria that will help us make our decisions. This criteria consists of specific standards that we'll use as really a guide to our decision-making process. It's important to outline this criteria ahead of time so that we avoid basing our decision on maybe a few factors without considering a host of others. So let's get back to our problem. We know that space is an issue and that we need to identify some criteria to help us generate some solutions to our problem. Cost is likely to be a key consideration as some options cost more than others. The time needed to execute a particular decision should also be weighed. Maybe even the extent to which the problem solves the issue permanently or if it's simply a quick fix. We could generate more, but I'm sure you're beginning to get the point here. One thing I will mention is that if our problem was actually trying to buy a house instead of solving a space issue, we would establish criteria a little differently. We'd likely focus on things like quality of schools, distance to activities, crime per capita, and some other factors. Now that we've identified some of our decision criteria, we need to weigh that criteria. Because each criteria is unlikely to have the same level of importance, we need to weigh those standards differently. There are a few ways that we can accomplish this. The first is by using what is known as an absolute comparison, which you commonly find in movie ratings, hotel ratings, and several others. This method of comparison is helpful because it allows the user to compare items side by side. So if you're shopping for a car, you can look through consumer reports and actually compare different vehicles in specific categories and all together. This is accomplished by incorporating a ranking system 
where users enter a value reflecting the importance of the criteria on a scale. Let's say that we establish a scale starting from 1 and going to 10. One would indicate that the criteria has virtually no importance to us whatsoever. A score of 10 would indicate that the item is very important. So we would go through each criteria and weigh their significance to us. Since this is an absolute comparison, we can assign the same value to different criteria as well, since we're evaluating them on their own merits and not in relation to another criteria. Applying absolute comparisons to our example, we may rate cost as a 6, time as an 8, and whether or not the solution permanently solves our problem as an 8. Another method of weighing criteria is to use relative comparisons. Relative comparisons involve actually comparing each criteria with another. So by rating each criteria against one another, we obtain an understanding of the criteria that are most important to us. This can be useful when attempting to weigh criteria that receive similar ratings under an absolute comparison. Take for example our last two criteria. Chances are that they are not equally important. So by rating them against one another, we firmly established which one is more important. The value of weighing our criteria is that we help shape the way that we make decisions since we know exactly what to emphasize and what to de-emphasize. Coincidentally, we're running a little short on space ourselves, so we'll continue with steps 4 through 6 of the rational decision-making model in our next video. For questions, please leave them in the comment box below, and I'll do my best to get back to them in a timely fashion. Do also remember to like this video and subscribe to Alan East Business Academy to have our latest videos sent to you while you sleep. Thanks for watching.